So, after the first tutorial in which I explained my ID method, I suppose now it's time to put the theory into practice for several weeks, as long as you appreciate this new format. Why you may ask? Because it would be absolutely impossible for you to tackle media like movies the way you are now, if you didn't assimilate the basis beforehand. Therefore, I consider it worthwhile for you to start reading animation credits, since you require tangible data in order to identify the animators themselves. Then you should assimilate the different styles of the supervisors and most important names, so that you get a better grounding of the matter. However, for your very first attempt, I'd suggest you to begin with the material animated by just one person. Which you might ask, but what's the breakdown with just one guy? A lot more than you can ever fathom. In fact, the first installment of the How to Animation Breakdown format is covering this, on the surface the easiest step, which still you mustn't take too lightly. What's apparently to be taken for granted, it actually conceals a few questions that require answers. Like how's the animator's usual performance like, how fast he is, is his work corrected at parts, and of course, what's his full name. On top of that, aforementioned names do belong to the supervisor and or important animators category, which you have to simulate anyhow, so I find this a solid way to get at least a rough idea. For instance, what do we mean by solo animated media? They are essentially short films, or even average 20 minutes long episodes, fulfilled by one single animator. A particularly productive one, who has to wrap the episode up within the stipulated 7-8 weeks, or possibly even more given such a stressful job. In the case of short films, though, it usually happens during specific situations like a studio enduring a recession or for a mere clip show to save time and money. However, our talk doesn't stop here, as given the necessity to finish the episode as quickly as possible, solo animators, regardless of their skills, might actually lack proper time to polish up their work. So modern animes have additional artists like the chief animation supervisor and second key animator support them by correcting the less convincing drawings, for the sake of visual consistency, since a better looking product is more marketable. Let's now give some concrete examples. Kenji Yokoyama is a notorious toy animator, mostly known for his all-around One Piece experience. He's a supervisor, solo animator and also a storyboard artist, as well as for a fleeting role in a Dragon Ball Z episode and for a much more regular presence in a Doctor Slump remake and in Jingoku Sensei Nube both in late 90s. He's highly regarded as a regular in One Piece, he's pretty competent even though he stopped making solo episodes a few years Years ago, better for him, I suppose. Who didn't stop though is Masaki Wane, perhaps the best known regular of the Pocket Monsters anime, originally one of the main studio cockpit animators. I know, I know. Back then his performance felt quite unclear due to Masunaga's massive corrections, but given his trademark snappy and dramatic character animation, I can totally view how much his cockpit experience has been affecting his creed. He doesn't stick to calmer episodes as he actually handles memorable battles alone, like Charizard against Magmar, Inferno vs Electivar, Toracat vs Incineroar, the Arceus level Bellsprout, and also Saguga worthy clips like the Jump Rope. Much to his physical detriment. Must have been a nightmare to wrap up. Nevertheless, his contribution is always warranted, both quantity and quality wise. But this isn't the actual reason you are here. You want something else. First off, has Dragon Ball ever involved the solo animators? Yes, they absolutely have. Ever since 1996, starting with episode 14, the official debut of the very first solo supervisor, freelancer Katsumi Aoshima, who fulfilled the majority of his episodes alone up to late Piccolo Daima arc. Even though his actual debut was as a mere key animator in the 8th episode, the fully outsourced the first series, the comedy prequel nobody watched, found this contribution absolutely necessary to hold their production together. In fact, it wasn't a rarity to spot him in crucial moments, such as the beginning of the 21st Tenkaichi Budokai arc, the final clash between Goku and Jackie Chun, or Tenshin Han firing his Kikoho in the 22nd Budokai. His debut is quite promising, featuring a substantial montage of Goku riding his skin tone, which I'm not going to lie, made me suspicious, since I used to believe for a moment he wasn't that alone after all. But then, I remembered, supervisors initially had to follow the source material as thoroughly as possible, 
so never mind. Aoshima is mostly regarded with nostalgia by the fandom, maybe because it's like a lost Studio Junior member with eye lines resembling softer Maeda-esque memories and thick eyebrows everyone always seems to enjoy. Still uncertain about the meaning of his missing tooth, especially on Kuririn. You always encounter someone who still wonders why he didn't supervise anymore upon episode 30 of Dragon Ball Z, as he would only partake in theatrical films. However, if there is one thing I don't really like is revisionism, because in spite of his crucial role, Haoshima had kinda frustrating limits. I get it, time's a key alright, and the animation process progressed across the years, but talent is individual matter, and lies outside technology and time too. His episodes might exhibit some decent action here and there, but his abundant conservativeness definitely diminishes most of his efforts. While I may understand why he would repeat some of his cuts, it doesn't make me place him on the same level as Iwan or even Yokoyama. Moreover, his material sort of has a strange way at some point, where he apparently believes adding slow-mo would make his work more impactful. Not once, not twice, at least a dozen of times, to the point that such a device loses its original purpose and becomes very annoying. So yes, I do have mixed opinions on Aoshima. On one hand, I kinda like his body language and expressive eyes, but he's not really a masterful action animator, he's more like a quantity artist, including movies, in which he was usually top credited. And before analyzing the other solo guy, I got to address the elephant in the room. Yes, Uchiyama did solo animate episode 55 of GT, a pretty abysmal one as well, which was essentially a clip show, with Vegeta explaining how his rivalry with Goku settled down, which suddenly inflames again once he agrees to become a Super Saiyan 4 with Bulma's blood wave gimmick. Can you see why it was a bomb? It was a waste of space, it derailed the main character's entire history, and Uchiyama not only hit his bottom in GT, but just doesn't fit that role. I realize why they would release a clip show, but considering how disjointed the Shadow Dragon arc happens to be, I just don't see the purpose of interrupting the story. It was truly a terrible vision. Now then, back to another name, possibly the most important toy name to date, I dare to say. If icons like Katsumi Shizuka and Naotoshi Shida can serve as heavy finishers, it's also thanks to productive people like him, as no matter which product he is in, he will always warrant his contribution at its fullest. Of course, the artist in question is Yoshitaka Yashima. 30 years of artistic supply, he's been another protagonist of so many animes, like Gegege no Kitaro, Precure series, Talking Pokemon series, Sensei Omega, The Avengers Cup Out, and of course Dragon Ball. Much like Yokoyama, he's able to do literally anything, from solo animating to provide concrete storyboards. Animation-wise, Yokoyama may have the upper hand since Yashima's action looks more simplistic and rigid, but Toei just cannot renounce his productivity. He's that swift. Especially if they have to deal with such disastrous pre-production like on Super, it would be nearly impossible to carry on without such a veteran. Sure, his pointy traits aren't that model-friendly on the surface, but since it's a modern anime, the chief supervisor and second key animators get to subdue his pointiness. Although, it's no new face in the series, as he solo handled the first half of 170 of Z, uncorrected, we'll get to that in the future, and supplied key animation in a couple of movies, only on Super is pragmatism truly shown. He's responsible for notable bits, like the Super Saiyan God Ritual, the amazing baseball filler, and Frieza eliminating Frost in a tournament of power. Let's take a look at the credits of the baseball episode, for example. Now, Kanzenshu usually writes down names on two columns, and leaves a blank space to separate full-fledged animators from secondary ones. In this case, though, Yashima's full name is written in the middle and second key animators are listed as usual. Regardless, the credits already explain why the episode worked out fine, because of Miyako Suji and uncredited Yamamoro's additional redrawings, of Kazuya Karazawa's direction, a phenomenal director who sustained Yashima centuries quite often, and of Bansan Lee's sensational art direction. Those landscapes look absolutely terrific. 
Sure, its pointiness may sound more appropriate for shows like Digimon, but the fact the fandom has been giving him positive feedback in these recent years actually demonstrates their condition when it comes to understand the difficulties behind visual productions. As for the western side, former Disney and MGM legend Ken Muse solo animated two clip shows, Jerry's Diary and Smith and Kitten. They may represent nothing worthwhile content-wise, but at least you can learn Muse's isolated quirks, like that Disney-esque approach that makes simple motion look so fluid, the solid character art and those three lumps on Tom's chest up until 1950, as he would stick to two lumps only afterwards like anyone else. Although, be careful with the credits. If Smith and Kitten displays his isolated full name as it should, Jerry's Diary adds Ed Barge for some reason, which is quite misleading since it's Muse's solo show. Maybe it's only my speculation, but given the recycled clips belong to Muse himself, Barge, Pete Burness and George Gordon, they must have credited the only animators who were still working at MGM, omitting the other two who previously left. Moving on, Warner Brothers also feature a solo clip show, his hair-raising tail, crediting Fritz Freeling's entire unit, but only Virgil Ross provides new content. He was one of the most graceful artists therein, who strongly emphasized the body language and gestures and visual composure. He often tends to draw eyelashes when characters blink and one or two footpads on Bugs Bunny or Sylvester. As for the original stuff, the post-shutdown period definitely took a toll on the main three directors. Chuck Jones managed to land on his feet, since he could still avail of two tremendous artists like Canaris and Ben Washam, who tackled No Barking and Rabbit Rampage respectively. No Barking may not be a particularly unforgettable short, but is totally carried by Harry's resourcefulness, always proving he can make hard things look so simple. Whereas Rabbit Rampage attempts to recycle the concept of Duckamuck, but with Bugs playing the victim and Elmer as the spiteful artist. Could have been Daffy Duck, what a missed opportunity. In any case, while Duckamuck was a way more unique and memorable experiment, Ben Washam remains the quintessential Jones animator. He always seems to embody his spirit better than anyone else, including Harris too. He's all about sharp features and keep an eye on Buck's lower footpad being bigger than the upper ones. That's a trick to ID him. Conversely, Bob McKimson endured the worst fate, as not only his unit had been dismantled, but he also had to animate his own shorts. The whole idea is a quite interesting test for what it's worth, but unlike Jones' unit who gradually got better over the years, McKimson's 50s output looks more stiff than his outstanding stuff in Avery and Clampett's cartoons, as if he was no longer used to cover his ancestral role prior to his promotion in 1946. As for Freeling, Pappy's Puppy was produced after Ted Bunningsen had joined McKimson's unit, whose plot kinda rips off MGM's That's My Pup, ending up more annoying than funny. Much like McKimson, Jerry Chinicki's 50s performances are normally not as compelling as they were in the 40s, with minor exceptions, but maybe it's just me, but it seems to draw characters in two different ways in mid-50s, the polished way, quite resembling his 40s work, and the unpolished way, which will influence Bob Matt's performances in the 60s. I sure hope all these names didn't confuse you, because the fun has barely just begun. This was only step one, since there is a quite long journey waiting for us on the horizon, and it won't be a season.